Okay, so uh, welcome to those of you that might have joined us during the housekeeping. Um, as, a, as an overview of what we're going to cover in the hour or so that we have today, uh, three parts to this webinar. The first is an introduction to the broad world of volunteering and volunteer management. And this is very much about getting your head in the right space to approach volunteering. It can be quite overwhelming, a bit scary, um, setting up your relationships with volunteers. Uh, there's often a lot of questions that come through um, around that. And we're going to cover some of the obvious ones uh, today in, in that first part. And then the second part is around practical tools to improve your engagement with volunteers. So we'll take some of those broad themes and we'll try and put them in a context for parent care forums, which will give you um, some information uh, to take away with you and, and um, employ your own systems. And then as I hinted at earlier in part three, we'll have a, um, a question and answer session with any that come through um, as we go that we haven't been able to address. Um, and we've allowed roughly 20 minutes for each of these sections, but um, uh, uh, we, may, um, we may not need the full 20 minutes for the question and answer, depending on how many come through. Hopefully that sounds great. And if you're listening to this, it hopefully means that you are um, uh, working within a parent care forum and you're either already responsible for engaging volunteers or, or, or helping the forum set that up, or you're maybe starting out down this road. The content here is designed for, for people in, in that ilk, but even if you're not, hopefully it'll be relevant for you. So um, I introduced myself briefly earlier. Uh, I'm Gethin Williams. I'm the Director of Development and Engagement at Contact a Family. The, the Department of Development and Engagement that I'm responsible for includes the parent participation team. And these are the people that probably you will know uh, if, you, if you work in forums. Um, so you'll probably know our grants team. You may well know Ben and Rachel. You may have worked with Kate, um, uh, who was with us for a long time until uh, around the middle of last year. So hopefully you'll be familiar with those people. You may know Helen, our administrator, who's working on the webinar today. And you may well know Gail Walsh as well, our head of parent care participation. So apologies if you're not fully familiar with me. Um, I, I was at the Parent Care Forum conference in November last year, and may have, you, some of you may remember me from those. Um, but I'm not here purely because I'm a complete management busybody and I like to get my, 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 uh, my, my, myself involved in all of the work off the parent participation team. I mean, coincidentally, that is true, um, but, and the team will probably attest to that. But I'm here because I like to work as closely as I can with forums so that I understand your world in the best possible way for when I'm going out and working with government and funders and other colleagues and making sure that they understand everything that um, um, uh, is relevant to you. So um, thank you for having me and thank you for being here. Um, and I suppose the other reason I'm here is because I'm responsible in contact to family for our own volunteering strategy and policy. And I have some background in volunteering from other roles in the, in the voluntary sector and in other charities. So I'm gonna try and use that and draw on that um, to uh, uh, hopefully provide some support for your roles in forums. And um, uh, I think um, uh, some of it's very, very relevant. So let's move on. Part one, introducing volunteering and volunteer management. In this section, we're gonna cover these areas. What is a volunteer exactly? What does volunteering in the UK look like? Who does it and why do they do it? And in context of this, I wanted to include a quick note about language here because people that work in volunteering often get quite sensitive about this and, and I think volunteers can do as well. Um, it's just a sort of um, a note of caution really sometimes. I and others in volunteer management roles try not to talk about using volunteers, especially with volunteers themselves. We understand that it can be, it can be quite off-putting or, or make volunteers um, feel like they are um, uh, simply unpaid labour. And of course, there's so much, there's so much more than that. Um, so we try and talk about engaging volunteers or working with volunteers when we go. It's quite a nice mindset to get into as we move along. Okay, let's crack straight on. So, Definitions of volunteering. There are several out there. This one comes from the NCVO, which uh, is the National Council for Voluntary Organisations. If you haven't come across them before, they're sort of the biggest trade or membership body for charities in the UK. Uh, and they, um, they, have a, they have a big volunteering um, effort there. So uh, this is a good place to start. They define it as any activity that involves spending time unpaid, doing something that aims to benefit the environment or someone, an individual or a group, other than in addition to close relatives. So it's a convoluted long way of saying that this is about giving back and helping out um, uh, beyond your immediate family, essentially. And central to this definition is the fact that volunteering must be a choice freely made by each individual. And I think those elements that we've underlined here are really the key ones to bear in mind. It's about spending time unpaid, 
it's about providing a benefit somewhere and it's about doing it under free choice. And as we say in the footnotes here, um, we often think about volunteering in terms of formal volunteering and informal volunteering. And you don't need to be uh, um, uh, too au fait with these terms, but essentially formal volunteering refers to volunteering that you might do through a club or an organisation or an actual group. And informal volunteering tends to be more um, helping out in the community, perhaps not necessarily through a charity or through a group, maybe more spontaneous than that, more akin to kind of giving back, turning up, taking part, joining in, those sorts of things. So for the purposes of volunteering in forums, what we're more thinking about is formal volunteering than informal volunteering, unpaid help through a group, club or organisation. And as you can see here, um, we're actually really, really good at volunteering in the UK. It's a big part of our civic life. Around 14 million people in the UK volunteer at least once a month. That's defined as regular volunteering. That's about 27% of the population. And the average time they give in those roles is over 11 hours a time. And uh, uh, don't ask me exactly how this is calculated, but people that know more about these things estimate the value of that work at nearly 24 billion pounds a year. So it's a significant form of social value and, um, and, and contributes in all sorts of amazing ways. If you include people that volunteer um, around about once a year, um, that rises to about 22 million people in this country and around 42% of the population. And that, that's quite high by international comparisons. If you think about informal volunteering, a bit more self-directed, uh, volunteering in the community, not through a group or a club, that rises even further. About 64% of people do that at least once a year in the UK. So some really quite impressive stats there. If we think about who volunteers, in a gender sense, it's roughly equal between men and women. Um, in formal volunteering, that's through clubs. Um, again, it's quite similar, uh, roughly um, uh, the same for men and women. But when we move on to informal volunteering, wider giving back in the community, it tends to be slightly more women than men. And um, even though it's, uh, it, it's difficult to say in concrete terms what kind of roles men and women tend to engage in, um, broadly speaking, women tend to engage in more caring volunteer roles and men are more likely to be engaged in advice or representative roles. Although I think Parent Care Forums might offer um, um, something of a bucking of that trend. In age terms, the groups that are most likely to volunteer are the ones, um, in, in, not to put too fine a point on it, with a lot of time on their hands, the young and the older populations, 32 and 31 percent, as you can see there. The lowest rates of regular volunteering occur amongst 24 to 35 year olds, um, uh, younger people perhaps starting out in life, studying, trying to make their way in the world, slightly more time poor than other groups. Youth volunteering has received a lot of attention in recent years in this country. It's sometimes called social action, um, tends to be quite self-directed and tied to notions of citizenship. If any of you have come across the National Citizen Service or know any young people that have been through that scheme, um, this is a really prominent example of a social action programme. Um, but it all falls within the broad sphere of volunteering. We include these uh, areas of information to give you an idea of um, the kind of people that might be open to volunteering with you if you're looking outside of your membership. In geographical terms, um, uh, uh, the highest areas for volunteering tend to be rural areas, actually. This may be something to do with um, uh, different levels of infrastructure, people being more isolated, more of a need for community action in, in, in a broader sense. And if you're from the southwest, the east of England or the East Midlands, then congratulations, because your regions have the highest rates of volunteering across across England. Um, although the biggest regional increase in recent years has actually come in Yorkshire and Humber, which um, um, I suspect may be something to do with sport. There was quite a lot of volunteering initiatives around and after the Olympics that were particularly prevalent in that part of the world. If we think about why people volunteer, the, the sort of the, the motivations that they have um, may, may differ or may be weighted in different areas. But I quite like this take on it. This is from some behavioral science research that's been done in the States recently, but is very applicable to our country as well. And they identify these six key factors as to why people volunteer. The values that people attach to the, perhaps the organization or the cause that they're volunteering with, that's an obvious one. Um, their understanding of a particular issue or situation increases, so it's about gaining skills, I suppose, in that sense. Personal enhancement and growth is a big part of why people volunteer. Uh, uh, help to get on a career path is, is particularly prominent in some volunteering roles. Uh, 
The social elements of volunteering should never be underestimated. People um, um, uh, typically volunteer uh, always with a sort of social aspect in mind, it's about strengthening their relationships with the local community. And this uh, protective aspect at the end here, number six, reducing ne negative feelings of guilt. I suppose this relates to where uh, someone might volunteer, where there's a sort of connection to something in their own life or their own experience, um, uh, perhaps giving back where they've benefited themselves. Um, so I think it's quite interesting to think about the kind of volunteer roles that you have and which of these motivations might be most important, because that will give you a real clue as to where to advertise, how to ask, and how to um, motivate your volunteers, I suppose, as you go along. And then this quote is one that you might see from time to time. I really like it. Um, uh, I can't remember the source of it, but it's, it, it's quite a famous one in volunteering circles. Volunteers don't get paid, not because they're worthless, but because they are priceless. Um, and that's um, something that I think uh, brings a lot of comfort to people that manage volunteers in, in the voluntary sector. Let's have a quick run through some of the key legal issues around volunteers. We're gonna talk about volunteers in the law, um, uh, some guidance around uh, paying volunteers uh, and when that's appropriate and when not. And we'll draw on some case studies and some work, particular to parent care forums around honorariums to help us illustrate this. So the first thing to bear in mind is that volunteers as a category in the law don't exist in their own right. There is no legal right that is automatic for you as a volunteer. There's no universal statutory definition. Any rights that volunteers uh, do accrue come from the contracts or the agreements that you as the host organization set up with them. And the contract or agreement is defined as something that has the following elements within it. There is an element of an offer, an element of acceptance, an element of some consideration of the value of the promises made, some, some definition of what they will be doing essentially. And then this sort of leads towards an intention to create legal relations. Um, that's not to say that you should avoid volunteer agreements, quite the contrary actually, but we'll give you some advice in a moment on how to set those up in the right way. A broad way of thinking about your work with volunteers is that you should try and extend the same sort of practices um, in terms of uh, pastoral care or your duty of care as you would for your paid staff. Um, where volunteers do accrue rights, it tends to be in areas of employment law. And so if you're treating your volunteers in a very different way, without good reason to your members of staff, then that's where you might start to run into some issues. Let's go a bit deeper into that um, in terms of how you set up those volunteer agreements. Some general rules of thumb here. Beware of the language of obligation in your agreements. These aren't paid employee roles. So instead of using we expect or uh, uh, this is the way things are, try to stick to language um, that's slightly softer. Our hope is that we do this. We suggest that you act in this kind of way. That's a safer territory to be on. However, there are some um, areas of work with volunteers where um, the need uh, the, and the legal obligations around some of those areas of work um, trump the need to avoid this kind of contractual language of volunteers. So where there's a safeguarding issue or where there's a, a data protection issue, um, uh, it's fine to say that you expect volunteers to comply with your policies in these area. And again, we'll draw, we'll draw out this in a little bit more detail as we kind of go through. The general rule of thumb with expenses is just to make sure that they are that they are obviously attached to the role that the volunteers are doing. Where expenses could be construed as additional to the role is where we start to get into trouble. And again, there's lots more information on this coming. It's a great idea, just like managing staff, to keep arrangements under review from time to time. The nature of the volunteer role may change. And um, maintaining a good relationship with your volunteers and making sure expectations on both sides are, 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 um, are understood in the same way um, is absolutely vital. Thanking volunteers is usually okay, shouldn't compromise your relationship and actually good volunteer management suggests that thanking in terms of recognition and reward is a vital part of getting the most out of your volunteers and making sure that they have a brilliant experience with you. And the important thing to remember is that you shouldn't, shouldn't be afraid. Um, litigation, getting sued um, by volunteers is very, very rare, but usually results from the rejection of the volunteer when you've maybe had to let them go or the relationship is really broken down, which causes the volunteer to lash out. Let's say a little bit more about paying volunteers and when you can and when you can't. So volunteers, of course, give their time without payment, but the principle here is that no volunteer should ever be out of pocket for the volunteering that they do. And so the typical um, out of pocket expenses that you are able to pay without fear 
include these elements here. Travel to and from the place of volunteering or to other venues. Paying for childcare to allow the volunteer to work with you is perfectly acceptable. Um, uh, subsistence, refreshments and meals um, during the volunteering activity is perfectly acceptable too. Care of other dependents, where there is a clear caring relationship, which of course is relevant to us in our world, um, is a legitimate um, form of out-of-pocket expenses. And any other expenses that they may incur in the uh, nature of the role, postage, phone calls, stationery perhaps. Being paid out-of-pocket expenses should not affect benefits or tax contributions. Um, a few possible exceptions in our area, more on which coming up. The risk with payment um, in a legal sense is bound up with employment law. Um, essentially what we're trying to do here is, is, is not um, um, make, out of, make expenses available to volunteers over and above the role that they have with you. Where that does happen, there is a risk that the status of that person in a legal sense can change from a volunteer to that of an employee or a worker and then that brings associated rights and protections with them. If you're a real quote-unquote volunteer you shouldn't have these rights and protections the same as paid workers um, but if uh, you are accidentally sort of straying into this area it may be because um, uh, your, the nature of your contract with the organization has changed and that contract doesn't need to be in writing it can be in how you treat them which is why when you're, when you're paying expenses um, need to try and make sure that they are always um, obviously linked to the role that has been undertaken. Anything that's sort of above that, um, even if you're doing it in the, um, with all the best will in the world because you want to sort of thank or reward or give an extra benefit, can be a very, very tricky area to stay in. So do be careful. As a volunteer, you're not paid for your time, but you may get money to cover expenses. This is to summarize what we've just been through normally limited to food, drink, travel, or any equipment that you need to buy. Any other payment outside of that might tip you over into being considered an employee and leave you as an organization open to challenge on that grounds. Um, and uh, the main way in which that tends to get expressed is, is through a right to payment, um, which would normally be set at the minimum wage. So be aware of this. And then here, a slide that you may like to come back to from time to time, if you have and this can happen in forums and other organizations actually, uh, volunteers that are really long-standing with you, giving an awful lot of time, um, it may from time to time be advisable just to sit back and, and, and look at the nature of their work and try and decide whether actually they are maybe on the paid employee side of the um, equation rather than strictly as a volunteer. And the way to judge that might be to look at these kind of categories. Think about the, the time that they're giving, um, the kind of agreement that you have with them, whether that's verbal or written down, what training they are accessing possibly from you, um, how they might um, make a complaint and any policies and procedures they follow there, and the timing of the work that they give to, how flexible is it? Um, if, uh, if that volunteering role is straying over into paid territories, you'd expect some of the arrangements that you have with them to look more like the column on the right than the left. So it can be a useful point of reference for you to come back to. One question we get asked quite a lot at Contact a Family is, is what's the difference between volunteering and parent participation? And if you've come across this as well, you may be um, um, uh, you know, yeah, justifiably confused, I think. Um, I'm not, I don't have the full answer for you today. It's something they're actually working on. But as you're probably aware, there's quite a lot of overlap between the two, but also some quite separate cases where participation um, practice differs from what we might do in volunteering. Remuneration and payment is one particular area there. Um, because of the existence of um, structures around honorariums and some other things that we put in place for very, very good reasons in parent participation, but that would um, um, have an impact on volunteering status. I won't say too much about this bullet point list on the right hand side here, but these are some of the factors that we are trying to consider in deciding whether you've actually got a volunteering role or a participation role uh, on your hands here. A quick word about honorariums in forums. An honorarium is uh, normally a one-off thank you or an unexpected payment. There is no clear legal structure around these. And in volunteering roles, some pay such payments are best avoided. They do tend to tip you over into a different sort of tax status um, and, and um, should probably be avoided in regular volunteering roles. However, as I said, we do have 
quite um, um, defined honorarium structures, at, uh, especially at a national level, in parent participation um, for, for um, good reasons. Um, but that comes with quite a lot of guidance um, that we have to be uh, quite careful in adhering to. So if you are going down an honorarium route, um, you should certainly um, seek external advice. Okay, I hope that was helpful. That was part one. If you bear with me, I'm just going to check um, my emails to see if anything has come through by way of questions to address before we move on. It doesn't look like they have, so we're going to move straight on with part two. Practical tools and tips for improving your engagement with volunteers. I'm sure none of us need reminding of some of the typical benefits in working with volunteers, but here they are anyway. They bring fresh ideas to what you're doing, um, extend your own networks, they provide an extra pair of hands, of course. There is a labour element, and we shouldn't be ashamed of that. Um, and this fourth one I really, really like, and just wanted to say a little bit more about. They bring their own experiences, skills, and insight. Often we find when working with volunteers um, that they can, they, that they, they can give uh, an experience or knowledge about how something is working that other people simply can't. I've done a lot of work with volunteers in health and social care, which is not a million miles away from our world in parent care forums. And if a volunteer has a particular experience of using a service before they volunteer, then that experience, their insight into that, how it looks and feels to them as a service user, can often be entirely different from the experience of um, somebody that's paid in that area to deliver that service. They, they are really seeing what works and what doesn't work from the coalface. So volunteers often are able to do things that paid members of staff cannot. If you've worked or if you've been volunteering for a while, you may be um, uh, aware of arguments around job substitution, which can be a bit thorny for us. Um, we want to avoid um, uh, being seen to, or indeed using volunteers or engaging volunteers. I'll pick myself up on my own language there, it's easily done. Um, uh, because we can't afford to pay people to do it. What I normally say in situations like that is that if you're trying to bring through a volunteer because you've lost funding and you can't afford the member of staff anymore, then you're probably not thinking about volunteering the right way or setting it up in a way that brings um, the most possible benefit to you. Volunteers can often do things that paid members of staff cannot. And so just replacing a paid member of staff with a volunteer is, is, is sort of missing the point. Think about what volunteers can do that members of staff couldn't, perhaps because they've got a different experience as members of staff, and set your volunteer roles up on those lines rather than as a straight replacement for um, um, a job description that you might already have. As I've hinted at, they can give an objective view of uh, what, you're, what you're going, I think where you're going maybe that is, apologies for the typo, and, and how to improve things in the work that you're doing. And of course they bring these wider community links and understanding to what you're trying to achieve. So there's often quite intangible benefits to engaging volunteers in your work that only really become apparent once you've been working with them for a while. In this section then, we're gonna cover recruitment, retention, recognition and reward. So to start with recruitment, how do we attract more volunteers to your forum? Well, clarity is obviously really, really important. It's, it, you won't waste any time by sitting down at the beginning of this process and thinking about really what you want volunteers to do. And as I've just alluded to, um, uh, it, it, you know, you can use some of the roles that you might pay people for as starting points, by all means, but don't let that limit yourself. Think about, think about where your volunteers might come from and what they can bring that people closer to your organisation or perhaps paid in your organisation cannot because of the nature of their roles. The level of management that you need to devote to working with volunteers can be, um, uh, can be quite different. Um, there's uh, the length of the role that they have, certain risk factors, particularly around data protection or safeguarding, which might require um, uh, a decent level of management with them, something quite similar to how you might work with your staff. But this is by no means a cut and fast um, or, or a hard and fast area here. Some volunteer roles may only require a very light touch um, a level of management, and that's absolutely fine. Think about who can volunteer in your forum and what your forum can offer volunteers. And we're gonna sort of touch on all three of these areas as we kind of go through this section. So how do you break down what those clear roles might be? Well, here are some ideas to start you off. Um, you might be looking at fairly formal roles in your forum related to governance. 
these tend to be more regular roles, fairly committed roles where you're looking for an element of commitment from your volunteers. And they may include uh, roles around being a secretary, a treasurer, or perhaps a representative related to governance. Other roles might be to do more with the development of your forum generally. And here we might be thinking of roles helping out in membership, perhaps social media, outreach events as an ambassador, in communications, and on your database as well. Um, and then finally, there may be very light, ad hoc, um, uh, no long-term commitment, just general helping out um, uh, roles that you may be um, uh, interested in, in advertising. And that's absolutely fine too. If you have a volunteer coordinator in your forum, it's, it's, it's perfectly okay to um, um, ask any um, beneficiaries that maybe want to give back, if you can just put them on your list, put them on your database, you may email them from time to time to say, hey, we've got an event coming up, can you come and help us out? In which case, you may not need a heavy management structure, you may not need to give them much training. South Gloucestershire Forum, um, uh, consider these kind of factors when describing their offer to volunteers. And again, it may be a helpful point of reference for you. Um, so they're thinking about what experience they might need, uh, what training they might like to give volunteers, what support they might need, um, what social contacts they bring. So in terms of describing who you're looking for, um, uh, saying um, uh, we might be looking for people with experience or networks in this area is absolutely fine. And, uh, and on the converse side of that, what social opportunities you can make available to them as well, which we know is a big driver for why people volunteer. And there are a variety of activities within the scope to develop areas of unrealized potential. So um, uh, alerting your volunteers to the kind of things that they can get out of the experience that they're going to have with you is a helpful list. Thank you, South Gloucestershire. If you're looking for volunteers, presumably many of you are thinking of doing this within your membership. And we know that um, uh, typically parent care forums have an average um, a connection to about 500, 550 um, uh, parent carers in their local area. So you, you, you should have a, a good source of um, membership on which to draw and ask for help. Um, and there are wider networks associated with that, of course, as well. Your local partners and the local authority and perhaps other local charities might help you to advertise these uh, things too. If you want to go beyond that, or if you want to think about you know, parent carers or, or others that, that aren't really connected to your forum at the moment, perhaps young people looking for skills or with particular skills that maybe you don't have. Social media has been a, um, a, seen a big increase in youth volunteering in all sorts of organisations in recent years. Then you might want to have a look at your local volunteer centre, which you should be able to find just by Googling volunteer centre uh, and the name of the area in which you're in. Or you can go to Do It, the national website, which is, which is a fantastic free um, um, source of uh, volunteers where you can advertise and you can you can post your adverts by the areas that you're in by the themes that you're looking for and the kind of skills that you have um, for free uh, and I believe there are well over a hundred thousand people registered on do it so there are people out there looking for volunteering opportunities that may be able to help and as I hinted at before some um, uh, forums may have or you may be thinking of um, getting a volunteer coordinator role together whose role it might be just to sort of manage these relationships a little bit or build networks of supporters who could be converted into volunteers when you have events or particular roles that you need help with. Um, if, you're, if you're just starting from scratch and thinking about volunteers for the first time, this may be a really good place to start. Appoint somebody in your forum to be the volunteer coordinator and get them to use webinars like this and plenty of other resources that are available to help, to help you design your, your volunteering needs in your program, essentially. We've talked a little bit already about levels of management that you might need for um, certain roles. And for roles where there is a perhaps a more intensive role or a more committed role that you're looking for or have elements of risk associated with them, um, here's some guidance on how to go out recruiting for those roles. Um, the areas that we're mainly thinking about here in a legal sense are safeguarding and data protection. What we mean by that is um, safeguarding policies come into play if the volunteer that you're bringing into your organization is likely to be around children or vulnerable adults, supervised or unsupervised. You, you, you may be um, well advised to um, uh, offer a, um, a stronger or, or more defined process around how you recruit these volunteers. And the second area is around data protection. 
And, and uh, the main example that we're thinking of here, although there may be others, so do, do check it out for yourselves, um, would be around if you were giving your volunteers access to any personal data, perhaps your database of membership, for example. Um, and in those cases, you will certainly need a, a DBS check, a disclosure and borrowing service check, which is the newish system that's, um, um, that's been put on top of criminal records checks. Um, a DBS check would be required for any volunteering roles where there is those kind of safeguarding or data protection angles on what you're looking for them to do. And in these cases, I think it's best to move towards the kind of recruitment system that you may be more familiar with for paid members of staff. So a clearly defined process, a clearly defined role description, an application form, the use of references and a clear interview process. You will want to show um, for your own peace of mind as well as for anyone external that might have an interest here that you've been through a proper process in these regards. Um, moving on to retention, how do you keep your volunteers? So this is where the volunteer management stuff really kind of comes in. So in this section we're going to look about their motivations and how to understand them in a bit more detail. We're going to look at how you might minimise misunderstandings that you have with them through the use of volunteer agreements and other policies and procedures. We're going to look at appropriate levels of management and contact for different roles and some, um, uh, some thoughts around how to reward and recognise your volunteers too. So um, we're going to start here with this. This is a tool called Givers that we're going to make available to you after the webinar and it's actually something quite close to my heart. If you look at the the, the kind of handout image there on the right hand side of this sort of concertina leaflet you'll see that there's the words join in at the top of that and um, this is actually the name of the charity that I used to work for before I came to contact a family and I really like this tool because it's a really quick short guide to how to think about volunteering in the um, in, in, a, in a really kind of helpful way if you're if you're a manager or a potential manager so Join In was um, a charity that was set up after the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games to try and continue the volunteering legacy, essentially. Um, you may remember the Games Makers and what an amazing moment that was for volunteers. It really explained volunteering and brought it to life for people that might not have thought about it before. And this tool, the Givers tool, comes from a piece of research that Join In did called Making Time, which is about essentially this, how to attract and retain volunteers in a better way using insights from behavioural science actually draws back to one of the earlier slides that we had. And what they identify really is that there are, that there are these six key areas that um, um, apply when you're thinking about volunteering. Um, uh, and they are growth, impact, voice, experience, recognition, and social. And uh, I won't go through them all in any detail now because it's probably easier to read them. Um, but they cover some really um, useful practical tips. So. Um, Impact, for example, um, how in the process of recruitment, how do you ensure that your the volunteers know that they will be making um, a real impact in your organisation? Um, one of the tips that they offer here uh, from um, interviewing a lot of volunteers all around the world is that it's often really good to get the beneficiary to ask people to volunteer in the first place. There tends to be higher rates of return and more people saying yes if the people that are really benefiting from the volunteering, that might be other parent carers for us, are the ones looking for the volunteers themselves. So how can you engage your membership in helping you find more volunteers? Often it can be more impactful if they do the asking rather than you. There's loads of really great tips like that that come out through this tool. So we're gonna share that with you after the, um, uh, after the webinar. But it's a, it's a great starting point and reference. If we move on to how do we minimize misunderstandings, um, putting together a good volunteer agreement is a really great way to do this. Um, it's normally a signed agreement. I suppose you don't have to, but I think, I think you sort of set up your relationship with a volunteer in the right way if you do ask them to sign it. That said, the language doesn't have to be very heavy. Um, if we refer back to an earlier slide, um, we, we, we talked about uh, asking volunteers to comply with certain regulations where there's, a, where there's a legal implication like safeguarding or data protection. But beyond that, you, you can keep the language fairly light and you don't have to compel them to, um, uh, to do anything particularly. We hope that, we suggest that, we think it would be a good idea if these kind of, um, these kind of things. They tend to be more used and more helpful for regular um, or very committed roles or riskier roles, but they can be used in, in any area where you might, uh, you might want to assure yourselves that the volunteer in sh uh, sort of knows 
how they're expected to behave in a role. At Contact a Family, we sometimes engage volunteers working alongside our advice teams, but giving advice is quite a skilled thing that requires particular levels of training. And sometimes we might not want our volunteers to be kind of going that far. So you can use a volunteer agreement, and this is one way that we use them, to really define for the volunteer um, the level of information that they are giving. Are they giving information or are they giving advice? And what are the lines between the two? A volunteer agreement is a great way to sort of reinforce that and it done done properly it can be it can be a really a gentle way of ensuring your volunteer knows exactly what is expected of them and conversely you can use the volunteer agreement to really make it clear to them what they are getting from you as well so as we say here elements of a code of conduct expectations on both sides it's a point of reference for future discussions so in checking in with your volunteers from time to time, in, in, in managing them, you can both go back to this agreement that you've both signed and, and think about how it's working out for you. It's not legally binding, but it doesn't um, uh, necessarily help you if you might be transgressing any of those earlier factors that we talked about, particularly around payments, um, that tip you over into a sort of employment relationship with them. So it's not a get out of jail free card, but it is a really useful, mature form of um, um, management of the relationship that you have. And yes, I probably would advise you to get it signed. We, um, um, I'm sure we have um, uh, templates of these kind of, quest uh, these kind of agreements that we can make available to you. And if any forums have already gone down this road and want to share them with others, then do send them into the team and we can um, make your, your good work available to others as well. Having clear policies uh, is, of course, one of the best ways of avoiding any misunderstandings. Um, for people on low incomes, um, uh, worries about um, any uh, out-of-pocket expenses they might incur may be a real barrier to volunteering. So you might want to be um, thinking about this upfront during your recruitment and making people aware of what you can pay and kind of what you can't. Um, here are some examples of, of kind of how that might sort of play out in practice, I suppose, um, and some advice there around advance payments too, which uh, are fine under certain conditions. I think the general advice here is just to sort of think through in advance what you're planning to do and ensure you're sort of staying within the broad parameters of good volunteering practice. You don't necessarily need a one size fits all for how you manage your volunteers. Um, some volunteering roles may be regular, they may be working with you every week, they may be quite intense, they may have elements of risk attached to them. Where those kind of roles are concerned, you may want to benchmark them against how you manage your staff. And again, um, there's no hard and fast rule here, but as long as you're displaying some sort of consistency with how you treat your staff in terms of management, then um, you shouldn't go too far wrong. So set your levels of volunteer management according to the level of the role. Um, if something is low risk, fairly light touch, um, then an agreement, having an agreement in place is great. Beyond that, um, um, some induction and a clear point of contact might be the minimum that you might need. Um, do make sure that they have a proper induction into your organisation. That can benefit them as much as it benefits you. And um, having a clear point of contact and the volunteer knowing that they have that point of contact can often be um, uh, uh, enough and everything that you need in terms of, in terms of management. And you can check in with them. It doesn't necessarily have to be on a regular basis. Uh, as we've said, more intense, regular or risky roles should follow similar patterns to management of line staff and um, build in the positives to your interactions with them in terms of how you manage them. Do talk to them about the impact they're having or the impact that your forum is having because they're directly contributing to that. This can be a huge motivating factor. Um, so don't always think about it in terms of how you might manage your staff where um, uh, performance or delivering a particular thing might be the key thing you're interested in. And then finally, do look for opportunities to celebrate your volunteers as well. Um, if, you, if you're running events, give your volunteers a prominent role in them and thank them publicly at it. Um, when I was working at Join In with the Games Makers, we asked them time and time again what the best form of reward they could have would be. And, and what they consistently said across a number of surveys a number of years was that a simple thank you was um, overwhelmingly their, their, their preferred thing. Many of them are very humble people. Um, you, I'm sure you know a lot of people in your forums who are volunteering who are like this. They may not even consider themselves to be volunteers. For them, it's just a way of life. They're just helping out. Um, so a thank you, particularly from a beneficiary, from another parent that's really benefiting from their work, um, goes an awful long way and can be a really meaningful way to, 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 to thank and to recognize your volunteers. 
Um, you can have particular celebration events for your volunteers as well. And paying for those kind of things, celebration events en masse, um, is normally absolutely fine, providing that the, the, the level of money that you're dedicating to it isn't completely out of order compared to the budgets that you have as an organisation. It needs to be fairly commensurate with the size of, um, uh, of your organisation, not too disproportionate. But thanking volunteers through a dedicated event for them, um, bringing them together to celebrate their work is often a wonderful way of rewarding and motivating and attracting others. Ask your beneficiaries to come to that too. And then there are some national campaigns that you can piggyback on. NCVO, who did the definition we used in one of the earlier slides, run a volunteers week uh, every um, June. I think it's the first week of June. And if you go onto their website, I think already you can start to download some resources to help you celebrate volunteers week. This is your opportunity to show them that you um, uh, uh, value their contribution can make them feel um, rewarded and motivated. A few other thoughts about recognition. Here are some examples of how other forums um, uh, typically do this. And again, it doesn't need to be over planned or take a lot of your time or resource to set this up. You can just make sure that you mention them in your, in your talks and in your meetings uh, with your beneficiaries, with your local statutory partners, in front of them ideally. Um, but um, make sure that they realize that their contribution is being recognized and it's important to the work of your forum. Praise and value. Make them part of your forum story. We couldn't do this without you. You can use certificates and awards. Um, again, there may be templates that we can make available to you to help this. You could consider volunteer achievement records where you might like to look at the time that they give, the projects that they've been working on. It doesn't need to be a formal document, but perhaps something that might help them um, thinking about their own CVs or their work experience, if that's a motivation to them. Something you can help them document what they're doing, the impact that they're having and what they're learning as you go. And you can do this through regular review meeting, uh, meetings for those volunteers that are working with you in a, in a more intense way. It can, be, um, it can be quite difficult to describe the impact that volunteers have. Um, we did quite a lot of work on the uh, join in and uh, again there's no fast uh, and hard way to sort of measure this stuff but this this diagram might help you to think about how you describe that impact to them um, because it, when looking at volunteers in all sectors um, one thing we find is that impact tends to come in a variety of different places or, or different layers this is a little diagram that we put together to illustrate the um, impact of um, volunteers and parent care forums. And if we move from the centre circle out, we can see that impact can be described in, uh, on, 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 on lots of different audiences. So if you volunteer, um, you as the parent care volunteer may have a lot of impact um, on yourself. So volunteering benefits you directly. It will also benefit the local families that are benefiting from your voluntary and work in the forum. It will benefit the forum itself um, um, because of the impact on the organization that you're having and it will have benefits in the local area as well and these bullet points around just describe the kind of ways in which you might think about what that impact is so I'll just go through those briefly so I've got parent care in the middle here but essentially this is about the volunteer themselves if you're a volunteer what are you getting out of it well a lot of this can be measured in well-being and there's quite clever ways of doing that and we can talk about that in a future webinar if people are interested but you can describe that impact in terms of the feeling you get from giving back to others or the knowledge and experience and expertise that you might gain yourself so there's a personal impact in volunteering um, which we should encourage people to recognize um, volunteering should be a two-way street and it's fine for volunteers to recognize that they're getting something out of it too it doesn't have to be an entirely selfless activity in fact it often works better when uh, the volunteer and the host organization recognize the mutual benefits that they're getting. In the bottom right in this, uh, in this list of impact for parent care forums, a forum benefits from a volunteers because um, through their work they are better able to advocate on behalf of parent carers in their area. Um, through having that volunteer in the forum they have a, a greater diversity of voice and experience coming in and it lends legitimacy to what they're saying the more people that they have volunteering with them. And that helps them be sustainable as well. Um, going back a circle um, in the top left, the, how, will, how would the impact look for local families? Well, through volunteering in a forum, through the forum doing their work, what you would hope to see in terms of impact on them would be better services, really, more responsive to local lead because they're understanding 
um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the service needs better through the work that the forum is doing. And uh, they might hopefully notice a more of a culture of participation growing up in the local area because of the efforts of volunteers in parent care forums. And then finally, in the local area itself, and this might be where your local authority partners notice the impact of the work that your volunteers are doing, they might start to notice efficiencies in the way that they deliver their service. Hopefully they're getting their services right first time and not having to repeat themselves because they understand um, how those services are playing out for local families better because of the work that volunteers are doing. And this has benefits in inclusivity and in a healthier local democracy overall. So that's just a quick whistle-stop tour through how you might consider impact and how you might describe impact to your volunteers. Well, did you know that you, know, you should be getting some impact here yourself? We, as the forum, are benefiting from you, um, obviously, because uh, you're, you, you're, you're helping us out, you're fulfilling certain roles. You're having an impact on the beneficiaries that we're working with as well, other local families on our books and in our area, um, because we're able to do more for them with your help. And actually, the whole local area as a result benefits from that too because of the um, accumulated um, impact and effort that you're putting in. Moving towards the end of our uh, webinar today, we've got about 10 minutes left and there are a couple of questions coming through. So I'll just try and leave an appropriate amount of time for those and hopefully we'll finish on time. Um, but to move towards that period, um, let's have a quick chat about rewards. What's okay? Uh, in terms of rewards. Well, I've hinted at this already, but generally rewarding volunteers as a group, so an outing, a party or a ceremony is absolutely fine and actually to be encouraged as long as the cost is reasonable in proportion to your total income and the scale of the contribution to the work made by volunteers. So um, this is why understanding the impact that they have is probably quite important because it'll help you judge what level of event or celebration you might want to um, put in place for them. Um, Again, with many of these things, it's, it's thinking about how you justify what you're doing uh, to yourselves and, if necessary, perhaps talk it over with your steering group before you come to a view. A small in-kind gift to an individual volunteer as a thank you is also normally fine. Again, it should probably be proportionate to the level of contribution that they've put in um, and, uh, and the income of your organisation as well. Just go back. I just thought I was missing a slide there, um, but I wasn't okay. What should you avoid by way of um, payments or rewards to volunteers? Well, anything that might be construed as pocket money is a bit of a no-no. So anything that goes a bit beyond out-of-pocket expenses. So where financial payments that you can't really um, uh, justify or aren't really obviously uh, connected to the role. Um, and you know, keeping expenses and encouraging volunteers to keep their expenses is a, uh, is, is a good way of doing that. Sessional fees uh, is included in things that should be avoided. Um, honoraria as well, one-off payments for work done. Um, but again, there is particular guidance around that in parent participation that you can access if you um, are, are looking to go down that road. But be aware of the legal implications that, that has. At that point, in the legal sense, you're probably not talking about volunteers anymore. Lump sums or other payments to cover expenses. I suppose this is um, th th this might be um, you know in a, in advance or. Uh, where where the costs might be sort of bundled together in a lump sum. These are best avoided, more difficult to explain or justify. Regular perks can be uh, um, an interesting area which, which does cause difficulty for some organisations. Um, free items in return for volunteering. Perhaps your forum has things donated to you that you might think, well, I can, I can maybe give that to the volunteer uh, uh, as a way of thanks. Just exercise a little bit of caution in this area. Um, Again, the general rule of thumb is that anything that you give them should be broadly related to the role that they're doing. So if you're making um, uh, wider perks available, then you may be um, um, uh, risking um, um, some comeback there. Training is a particular area where um, people sometimes fall foul of this sort of guidance, where it's, uh, where it's not really connected to the role that they are doing. And that can be tricky because if you've commissioned some training for your staff group, for example, you may think to yourself, you know, quite naturally, uh, I'd like to make that available to our volunteers as well. Um, if the training is connected to the broad functioning of the forum and the volunteer is, you know, helping the forum in a general sense, that should be absolutely fine. But just have a think about it before you administer it. If you're giving them particular training, which is clearly in quite a different area, 
to the role that they're doing, that does start to tip them over into the sort of employment area. Um, and just to sort of put some formality around that, um, um, some quick slides on training. So training is not a benefit in kind if, and benefits in kind are the things that you want to avoid. Benefits connected to the role are the ones that you want to stick to the side of. So training is not a benefit in kind, i.e. it's fine if it's necessary to perform the volunteering role and it's given for the sole purpose of improving the volunteers or the intern's ability to carry out the role. So my point just now around um, if you've got training going on anyway, can you give it to the volunteer? Um, uh, difficult to justify it if it's, not, um, uh, if it's not connected to the volunteer role. So again, is it necessary um, for the course of their voluntary work? However, training outside of this scope uh, may well be considered as a benefit in kind for national minimum wage purposes. It's important to know if the individual is a worker and therefore entitled to the national minimum wage. And as we say here, the consequences of this can be fairly serious. So do always check um, with training in particular, because this can be a trigger for these kind of cases. OK, that brings us to the end of the structured part of the webinar. Um, I hope that's been quite helpful. We've done quite a lot in an hour. We've got about five or six minutes before the hour is up. So I've had three questions in and we're going to try and deal with these um, as quickly as possible. Please bear in mind that I haven't had sight of these before. So if I don't feel uh, able to answer this in a meaningful way just yet, we will come back to them and perhaps post some written answers uh, after the webinar itself. So if you'll just bear with me, I'll just review these quickly and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you in just a few seconds. So the first question that we have here is um, a consideration that a forum is giving to training parent volunteers to deliver training to school staff, early support staff about the life of a parent carer to support the professional development of those individuals. How does that leave us in this context? This question came through a while ago, so I'm not entirely sure of the context that we're talking about here. Um, the questioner may well have been thinking about a particular slide. Um, I suppose volunteering here, or the volunteer roles, would be sort of connected to explaining what life is like for um, parent carers. That's, that's, that's what the question is starting to cover. Um, and it supports the professional development of those individuals. I can't think of any obvious um, uh, issues in terms of setting up a volunteer role with that kind of focus. Um, I think any, any, um, any risks that you might want to consider would probably be around the nature of the agreement that you have with the volunteers rather than what they're actually doing. But we'll give that some more thought and perhaps consult with the team and, um, and supply a written answer. Um, certainly um, an ambassadorial or an awareness raising role for your volunteers, sending them out into the community to talk to others about um, uh, what life might be like or, 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 or why they should be involved with the forum. Um, should be should be absolutely fine and perfectly acceptable. Normally a really good source of volunteer roles actually because they're drawing on a personal experience. You may, and I'm not sure if this is quite what the questioner is thinking, but you may wish to think about the kind of examples I was talking about earlier in relation to contact to family volunteers, i.e. when are they sharing their experience and when are they going a bit further than that? Are they giving information? Are they giving advice? Um, think about the messages that you would want them to be getting across and perhaps go through those with them and develop some scripts that they can use. Um, parent carers are experts in their own experience. That's one of the founding principles of contact to family actually. Um, and so you wouldn't want to inhibit that, but you, equally you would want to be clear that um, volunteers were, 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 were being very clear themselves when they were conveying information, what was based on a personal experience and, and what goes beyond that. Um, and the level of training that you might wish to give them would be commensurate with that too. Uh, if you'll bear with me, I just had some additional info in around that question, which might help. Oh, so it seems that question was related to what constitutes employment rather than volunteering. Okay, um, I'll, uh, we'll go back and look through that properly. I think I should probably consider that further before giving you an answer, but thank you very much. That's a great question. Question two, I'll just uh, 
review this quickly. That comes in from Carol. Thanks for tuning in, Carol. Have you got any example volunteer agreements? Yes, I'm sure we have. Um, there are a range that we can get together and um, I believe there we have the functionality to sort of make a load of documents available within this webinar where you can access it online. Um, and again, if uh, forums already have volunteer agreements they want to share with others, please do feel free to use us as your network to distribute them uh, and we will do so. And then the third question, ah, this is a good one. Again, this comes from Carol. Thank you, Carol. You've, you've, been, a, you've been a great contributor to the, uh, to the webinar today. Can we use the DFE grant for volunteer celebration then? That's a good question. I can't automatically think of a reason why you couldn't. Um, I think uh, volunteers in contributing to the work of the forum, uh, I would refer back to your um, guidance on the condition of grant there but I wouldn't uh, I, w I wouldn't think that um, uh, engaging volunteers in the core purpose of your forum um, as long as the link there is really clear would be any different to the guidance that you would get for um, how to spend the money in the grant um, it sounds fine but again I think we'll put something together and uh, and consider that properly Okay, that brings us to the end of our questions and I think to the end of our webinar today. Um, I really hope you found that useful. Uh, please do fill out your feedback forms. Um, they're very, very helpful to us. Uh, and you can include technical things about how your experience has been and as well about the content and any future sorts of webinars that you might want from us as well. Um, but in the meantime, uh, all it remains for me to do is to thank you again for tuning in and to have a fantastic weekend for those of you for watching this live or tuning into this live. For those of you on catch up, please do not phone. Lines are now closed. That's my little joke. Okay, uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Um, thanks for uh, continuing to work with us and all the best with your working forums with volunteers. And we will post some uh, follow-up questions to those uh, additional um, uh, questions uh, in, the, in, the, in the course of putting this online for more people to view. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.